Welcome to the Dumb Idea Podcast Show with Mike and Alex. We thank you for joining us as we have a couple of beers and a cigar and talk about what's going on in our lives. Grab an adult beverage and a smoke and settle in with us. Please like, subscribe, and comment on each show so we can hear whether you agree or disagree with our take on things. Listen wherever your favorite podcasts are and at www.dumbideapodcast.com. Somebody's grandma apparently was driving a cargo ship through the Suez Canal (laughs) and didn't park it right because they basically ended up turning the thing so it blocked the entire canal and the bottom of it got stuck. Yeah, so it, it, it ran aground and uh the Suez Canal is one of the the busiest one of the busiest waterways in the world. And um it for those of you who don't know, it essentially uh was it connect the Mediterranean Sea and the uh was it the Red Sea or the uh one of the the, uh, I need to brush up on my geography here, but oil travels through it. Essentially, it's a connector to get to the Indian Ocean, and the Med connects uh, essentially the west to the east, so ships don't have to travel around uh, Africa. So now this enormous uh, container ship, it's um, owned by Evergreen, and it is stuck across the canal currently, and... Uh, the ramifications of this is bigger. We, you know, we like to joke and say, "Hey, it's uh, it's stuck in, you know, ha ha, it's it's there." But oil can't get through, goods can't get through, um, so it's quite the mess. And and it's more than just a a grounding. Um, the ship is kind of wedged in there, and so it's, you, you can't get anyone by going north or south because of the ship. At least if it, if it had grounded on the side, they could have routed traffic around it. But unfortunately, I mean, this whoever captained this ship pretty much made sure no one's getting an iPad until Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Nobody. So, if, you, if, you ordered, if you ordered a car and it was going, if you're in Europe and you ordered something, if you ordered a Ford Escape, you're not getting it. Yeah, it's, it's stuck there. And this, uh, this ship is, um, it is, it's absolutely enormous. I think it's. Uh, they, said, f- they said lengthwise, it's as long as the Empire State Building is high. Yeah, so it's it's 400 meters high, and uh, it's completely loaded. So, what they do with these container ships is they put um, they just stack the containers on top of the ship. So it it'll have a big superstructure that when it's not loaded, you can see, and it looks like a you know a ship with a tower on it. And then when it's loaded up full of containers, you can no longer see that tower. It's just the bridge. That kind of looks out over the top of these Connex trailers. I saw the picture from the back end of this thing. And even from a distance, this thing looks massive. Just containers stacked on top of containers stacked on top of containers. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And apparently they said it was coming from China and going to Europe. Yep. So nobody in Europe is going to get any of that stuff. Yep. And, and, and they're going to, I guess they're going to claim a huge insurance claim on that, on that boat. But I, I, I guess the point is, I mean, it, they say 12% of all the world's traffic goes through the Suez Canal. Yeah. And they're now saying it could be, what, two weeks mm-hmm. before they can clear this thing. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's unbelievable that they're going to, that this one thing, I, I'm surprised they haven't tied it to some extremists. Oh, I do. Well, yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure, like, so this isn't a terrorist attack, like, you know. You're not the captain anymore of this ship. Like someone went in, just, I, they turned the wheel and said, "We're going to shut this down." Yeah, I I am the captain now. So, <laughs> so what? But what happens with these ships is when they enter the Suez Canal, whether they're coming in uh, through the north or south, a, a pilot actually boards the vessel and is in command of the vessel. What? And it, it, anyone who's ever been on a cruise. Um, I'm kind of a nerd and I'm into this stuff. So I, I watch and you'll see the pilot boat come up and a dude jumps off uh, and then gets onto the boat and or onto the ship and is then in command while it's in these waters. They're experts at these at, in these areas. So like all the major ports have them, canals, Suez Canal, Panama Canal, um, St. Lawrence Seaway up up in, uh, you know, uh, between the U.S. and Canada. They all have these these people that guide these ships well this pilot you know um it's easy to blame him because he was in charge of it but uh 
there are some other factors that come into play. They're saying that there was uh, there was a rumor of a mechanical electrical issue, and then there was also a rumor or, uh, that it was very windy that day, a sandstorm. So sand, it got, it said yeah. a lot of sand got in the canal. That, yeah, that led to the buildup, and they're they're hoping that maybe the high tide will come in and help out. But I don't. From the pictures that I saw, I don't think it's going to help. I, I actually saw one where they had uh, essentially a, uh, not a crane, where the the the, the digger was right next to it like this this enormous digger <laughs> looked like a little tonka truck try, next to this thing and it was it's just one bucket yeah, try, trying to dig it try, out like, a, like yeah like you're trying to dig snow out from your right. tire when it's stuck but could you could you imagine being the operator of that thing <laughs> and just saying i can't believe they have me out here doing this. there's no way i'm digging this thing out right, yeah like you want me to do what with what yeah um you want, me, yeah. you want me to take my little digger and you want me to dig that out <laughs> uh, uh, you get paid more than me. You, this is this is your plan. Yeah. No, well, all right. Yeah. So and, and so this ship, it it's it's there and it's stuck. That it's not just run aground. Um, the actual stern, and I, I'm not sure how these ships are. A lot of cruise ships will have what you call azipods. So rather than having your traditional prop and rudder set up, it'll have the motors. Their diesel engines on board that power electric motors that are in these pods, almost like you'd see on an inboard outboard or an outboard motor. And they can spin them around. That's how they steer the ship. So this ship, this stern, which is actually where the, which is where the the uh, the the props are, is like dug into the side of the canal. So it's not just sitting on the bottom, which is easy. I've run a couple of boats aground in my day, and eventually you can either unload it and float it back off, or you wait for the tide to come in and you float back off. But that was a twenty-seven foot center console. This is a four hundred <laughs> meter long. Uh, uh, vessel um well they said one of the things that they're going to try and do is they're going to try to offload some of these containers yeah but here's the problem though you're not near a port where you've got the cranes and the operators to do this right what, what are you going to helicopter I, these things off yeah and who knows what's in them so i imagine they load the heaviest containers towards the top um which would because if you put the if you did the opposite the ship would be unstable so I imagine they put the heaviest ones. So maybe the or the the heaviest ones are on the bottom. So the lightest ones you could you could pick up and fly them off. But wouldn't that's be, a big helicopter. Wouldn't that be the equivalent of li lifting a feather? Yeah, off of a sunken yeah. ship. Yeah, you're getting yeah exactly because you're taking. Say you have a say you have the so these Connex trailers the, the inter the, these intermodal containers they're used on trains and they can put them on semi trailers. So it's essentially a fifty three foot long steel box that's filled with god knows what so if it's filled with say ammunition um that's gonna be very heavy if it's filled with teddy bears it'll be very light and i'm sure the ones at the top are probably filled with teddy bears as opposed to lead so they're going to end up being removed if you can remove it but the if you drive to any any port that has the big gantry cranes that pick these things up off of these ships they're enormous and it's a, you know, but then what do you do with them? You're in the middle of the desert. Like, you well, just lay them there and say, oh, we'll come back and get them. Yeah, yeah. they'll be there. Well, judging, judging by the pictures, this ship is near nothing. Yeah. Like, it yeah. doesn't look like there's a town nearby. No. So could could you imagine, though, if you were just an opportunist? Yeah. Yeah. No, knowing that some of these containers are going to get lifted off. Oh, just hang out. And and. Maybe one of them pops open. Yeah. Someone's going to make a lot of money off of this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be people running around in Egypt with, with you know, designer jeans and sunglasses and iPads. And, Range Rovers. Yeah, God knows what else is coming on these things. So, yeah. But, you know, which which is, what about all this stuff that's on here? Like, not only are we, there's the stuff that's on the ship, of course, but... Now you're looking at the goods that need to transit through this area. Well, it's going to create a shortage of it, too. I mean, think about the, even if you're talking about the destinations. Right. Because it's not going to get to Europe. And then on top of that, you've got all the ships that are docked in, in the beginning of the canal and all of them that are docked on the other end of the canal. Yeah. That can't get through. Yep. So you've got natural gas. You've got oil. You've got other fuels. You've got other cargo ships. Yep. That can't get through. Now, some of them, can they get rerouted? Sure. Yeah. But some of them, they're already in. Yeah, they're waiting. And they can't go. Like, yeah. So I guess there's different stage points. Yeah. So some of them, at least from the, the, the picture I saw, they, there's, I would say about 
30 ships sitting on the southern portion of this canal. Another 30 up at the top. And then you've got a spattering of like 15 more ships. Yeah. All within the canal. Yep. They can't, you can't just turn around. No. And and, 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 and even if you're on either end, what, what are you going to Pop it in reverse? Yeah. <laughs> you get another Yo. ship stuck? What are you going to say? I'm coming around. I'm coming around. No, no, you got to move. I'm coming. I'm going to come around, not not you, me, me. I'm coming around. I'm going to go back. I'm going I'm going around. I'm going to what, South Africa. Yeah. I'm going to I'm just going to make a UE. Yeah. I'm going to hook it. I'm going to yeah. hook it around the, the 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 horn, the horn of Africa and I'll come back up. Yeah. It might take me another 4 weeks, but I'm doing this. I'm yeah. not I'm not waiting here. What I'm sure I'm sure some will. Um but then you have the thing about in in the ports where this stuff gets loaded. If you know that that ship has to go through that canal are you going to load that ship if you're the shipping company um say you're maersk and you have a ship that's getting ready to get loaded full of teddy bears in malaysia and whatever else is coming out of there because this is also you know these ships are coming from asia southeast asia which is you know if you think you know china vietnam malaysia there are a lot of things are made there that end up in in the west and europe what then happens once it goes you know once it gets up there, it's going to be like, why would you bother to load it? Well, I'm sure at this point, I mean, if they know it's going to be shut down for six weeks, you might see more air freight yeah. out of China. Yeah. As someone who's ordered stuff from China, you can, you can get something here, DHL freight, within like two weeks. Right. I'm sure they could ramp, up, ramp it up a little bit for yeah. DHL to start shipping across the world. Yeah. but. Others might, I, I guess they could come through the Panama Canal and yeah, go across get, the Atlantic. I mean, yeah. if, if Europe is the destination, I, I mean, and the other part is, I mean, I don't know my geography that well either, but I mean, China it being in Asia, maybe ground transportation, yeah, maybe through Russia, mm-hmm. but that would create a whole other sort sort of problems there. Yeah, if people don't want to play nice, yeah, or if people get a little opportunistic, they're going to jack up the prices. But even or the ships, if they want to go around the Horn of Africa, it's more fuel. Yeah, you know, it's a lot more, more fuel. So, yeah. so your Ford Escape just went from you know twenty seven thousand to thirty five. Yeah, be, or it probably wouldn't be that extreme. But you know, if you're adding another three grand to it, yeah, everything's going to cost more. I yeah. Mean, so I'll, I'll be interested to see how this affects other things, like in the country now in the U.S. Um, car prices have gone up. Mm-hmm. Mostly because new car prices have gone up because manufacturers can't get the chips from China to put in these cars. Everything's run on a computer. Yep. And so they can't get the chips to put in the computers. So they can't make they can't make these cars. I I think they said that there was a a car plant in Ohio. I think it was GM had to shut down for three weeks because they don't have supplies to make it. And then on top of that, they were saying there's a lack of foam that goes in these cars for the insulation. Yeah. So now you don't have foam. Mm-hmm. Now you don't have chips. Yep. You're shutting down plants. So the the car prices, new car prices in America going up. That's going to, in turn, if people can't even get new cars, let's say you can't get new trucks. Yep. Used truck market is going to go through the roof. Oh, the used truck market is through the roof anyway. Well, and that's because the... the the new trucks are so expensive that people buy the used trucks, but that that puts the the value of of the used vehicle even higher. So I was getting my car, my wife's vehicle, uh, <clears throat> serviced at the dealer, uh, Toyota dealer. So I I'm perusing a lot, just walking around, and there was a used Tundra. It had like 118 thousand miles on it. It was maybe um, you know, eight nine years old. And let's, they s- let's play a game. Let's play yeah. a game real quick. <laughs> I'm going to try and guess the price of this. Go thing. ahead. Go for it. I'm going to say it was $15,000. It was seventeen. dollars Close. Jeez. Yeah. seventeen. Right. Yep. For over 100,000 yep. miles. Yep. What, what year was it? That was, let's see, this was this was uh, a couple years, a couple months ago. So I'm going to, I want to say it was still this current generation of Tundra. So it wasn't the old version. So I'm going to say it was probably a 15 or 16. So 
That's even not too yeah. bad, though. I, yeah. I, th- I thought it was going to be like an 06, 07. Yeah. <laughs> because, to be honest with you, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. A truck with around 100000 like Once you get to 150, the prices will start to drop. Yeah. At 100, 120,000 miles, especially if it's in good condition, yeah. and this, you're going to pay for it. Uh, the body was beautiful. It was, a nice, it was a nice truck. And I actually, of course, the salesman came out and said, yeah, you're interested in it. And I said, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in as far as until my wife's van comes out of the <laughs> comes out of service, but so I talked to him and I said, uh, "Can you move on?" He goes, "He's like, no." <laughs> I said, yeah. "Didn't think so." And that's the thing; they're commanding these prices. I just sold a vehicle. Uh, I sold it to a buddy, but I I probably could have sold it for more had I wanted to go through the the whole having people come to my house from you know on on Craigslist or Auto Trader or one of them, and you know wanted to deal with that. But he needed a, a vehicle. I was getting rid of one, so it worked out. But Another friend sold a an old Honda Ridgeline that had some rust issues, and and it, the the ad was was posted for fifteen minutes. A dude came and bought it. So well, and it's kind of like last year when I when I had my car, and I I kind of came into a third car. So I I had a, an extra car because we only have the two drivers in the house, and I was like, you know, let, I tried to sell my my personal car probably about four months before this happened and i got a really low offer on it i mean i, I think i i owed about 14 on it i ended up i, I got quotes in like the 12 the 11 5 range you know, nothing near what i owed and i was like okay you know party's over i'm not gonna sell it i'll just keep it and drive it and then right as the pandemic hit right as the march april time period all of a sudden the the supply of cars went down mm-hmm. and so oddly enough i listened to a podcast and, <laughs> and, and they said look check if you're looking to sell a car check carvana check vroom which is, is very similar to carvana and that they only sell online mm-hmm. they'll ship anywhere so i went on carvana and they offered me 14 mm-hmm. now that's already two grand more than i got offered three months before yeah and then I went on Vroom. Vroom offered me fourteen six, which was more than I owed on this car. Mm-hmm. So here I am. I got a third car. I'm not paying any money on that, and I can drop a car payment. Yeah. It was the easiest transaction I've ever had to do. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to go into a dealership. I didn't get pressured to buy a vehicle. All I did, I went online. I submitted all the information on my car, the VIN number, color, this. I sent a couple of pictures in. They sent someone out to verify it, said, okay. And the offer that they made me within the first five minutes of me going on the website was exactly what they gave me. Wow. And I didn't have to do, I didn't have to deal with any of them. Yeah. And they came, they picked up the car on a tow truck and took it away, paid off my loan, gave me the remainder Mm -hmm. and it was done. Nice. Yeah. I I didn't have to go to a dealership because the dealership I think is probably one of the top three places people hate to go. Yeah. Probably dealership post office mva um or dmv depending on where you live sure. what they're gonna what they're gonna say i kind of like going to the dealership to buy a car because it reminds me when i was a little kid and you know you're excited and you get to see all the cars and well, and they fawn over you oh yeah they oh, treat you like gold you want welcome, a coffee welcome you're, you're the best person on earth <laughs> but oh you like this one we can give you this one we can oh, make this work for yeah. you would you like some coffee would you like some tea you're the best person on yeah, earth oh yeah yeah we'll get oh i'll I'll get you in that car. Yeah, you'll get me in that car. $800 a month, you'll get me in that car. Right, yeah, of course. But the, the, so I actually hit up Vroom for that, for the vehicle that I just had to get rid of. And I'm filling out the thing. They had the questionnaire, like, is it running? I was like, mm, no. Uh, is it, like, is there anything wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with it. And the only reason it wasn't running is it needed a battery. I should have checked yes to see how it changed. But I go through it, and uh, this was, uh, this was, you know, it was a it was a nice little car. It wasn't that old. It had low low miles on it for its age, and they offered me seven hundred bucks. It's like, yeah, screw you, right. <laughs> get seven hundred bucks. Right. Your lost room. But, uh, a junkyard will probably give you a little more than that. For I the know. Scrap metal, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they give you like I think it's like fifty cents a pound or something like that. So <laughs> yeah, anyone who ever, if you ever have a car and someone offers you less than a thousand dollars for a running car, yeah, or even for a non running car for that matter, yeah, they're you're, you're at the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah, because even for a thousand dollars, some even if your the transmission is blown, mm-hmm. and I and I've done this, 
I, I had a, it was a 2004 Acura. Notorious, those cars are notorious for blowing transmissions. Even with me buying a used transmission and putting it in that car, I was still able then to take the running and driving version mm-hmm. and sell it for more than I had into it. Yeah. It wasn't a lot more. Yeah. But for anyone to say, oh, your car is only worth $700. Yeah. I mean, at that time, I think the car, that car was probably about 12 to 13 years old, mm-hmm. had 120,000 miles on it. It was in decent shape. Yeah. But it still sold for about $4,300. Yeah. So if someone ever comes to you, if you have a, a broken down car mm-hmm. and you don't want to put money into it, it $1,000, that's the bare minimum you should yeah. get, in my opinion. Yeah. I. So it's funny because when I was in the market for $1,000 cars, uh, when I was in college, I'd spend, you know, she, I had a friend in college. He would never spend more than $500 on a car. And he's like, hey, if it runs for six months, you know, that's I'm doing pretty good. Right. You know, six months at, at 500 bucks, I'm less than $100 a month. You're not going to find a car payment for that. If it dies, I junk it, I get another one. And he kept one year, he had four different cars because they would just die. He'd junk it, get another one. And, you know, it, it was funny, but uh, another friend of mine, this uh, this idiot, he um, he goes and he had a, uh, it was it was a Chevy, a Chevy Beretta. Nice. So I remember now, those. Yeah. Now, this is back in the, in the late nineties, early two thousands. And he decides that he wants to buy a Camaro. So, and you know, we're talking like a, uh, like a fourth gen, uh, Camaro. So he decides to go buy this Camaro and he takes it in, he takes the Beretta to the dealer. And, um, he thought this car, the world of this vehicle. And he goes to the dealer, the dealer and he says, uh, yeah, I'll, you know, I'm I'm thinking two grand on the trade, and the sale, the salesman says I'll give you five hundred bucks and the tank better be full. Right, so, like dealerships you know. are a lot different though, because they have to, they have to hit on almost every car. Yeah, because if you got twenty five cars, and let's say you lose two grand on one of them, mm-hmm. you screwed your whole month up. Yeah, yeah, you got to make it up, and I think a lot of car buyers don't quite. Um, they think they, you know, I want to know what the dealer paid for it. You're not going to pay what the dealer paid for that car. Right. Because then there's no point in selling cars. So, well, so I, actually, there's an interesting story about that, though, because the, the the biggest car dealership in America right now is AutoNation. Okay. All right. AutoNation, years ago, they went and bought up a whole bunch of dealerships. Mm-hmm. And lately, over the last couple of years, they figured out a formula where they'll almost sell the car at the their invoice price, mm-hmm. almost what they're buying them for. Mm-hmm. But what they're gonna where they're gonna make their money is in the finance shop. Yeah, they're yep. gonna make their money on selling you gap insurance. Yep, they're gonna make their money selling extra warranties, the, the extra warranty, yep. extended warranties, and then also they're gonna make money on your loan. Yeah. So for example, let's say I'm in the finance office. And you say, I don't have a loan. What do you, what do you got for me? Mm-hmm. They have five to seven banks, and some of them you have more. Some have up upwards to 20. Yeah. But they have these portals where they only have to enter your information once. Mm-hmm. And within minutes, they're getting responses back from these banks as to whether you're going to qualify for one. Yeah. And then two, they always see the lowest interest rate they can get. Mm-hmm. They can see it. They don't show you that on the screen. Yeah. So what they do is... Let's say the bank comes back to them and says, they're approved, 100% financing, 2.5%. Mm-hmm. The person in the F&A office isn't going to tell you 2.5%. Or do I tell you 3 They're going to say you need $1,000 down uh-huh. at three and th- 375 mm-hmm. And you're going to be, oh, that sounds so high. I went, you know, I was online and I went on LendingTree. Yeah. And they said current rates are 25 Yeah. And they're going to look all perplexed at you. Mm-hmm. They're going to look at you. Oh, you know, let, let me look. I, I try to get you the best deal I can, but let me let me try one more time. Let me let me see what I can do. Right. And they're probably clicking away. Mm-hmm. Right. But they're not clicking on anything. Yeah. They already know what the rate is. Yeah. So they come back and they say, OK. We can do three hundred dollars down. Well, just to cover the, the first payment, three hundred dollars down. Yeah. At three percent, 
Mm -hmm. I was able to cut it down three quarters of a percent. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, you know, look, I I could go on lending tree, but I'm already here. Yeah, I'm already here. I could drive. I want to drive off with this car now. Right at this point, you you are in, you are in your mind. You bought this car. Oh yeah. If you make it that far, you you already want it. Yeah. And if, even and then even better, you are approved. Yeah. There is nothing stopping you from taking this car home. Right. Except for you. Yeah. Right. Your no is what makes you not have a new car today. Yeah. And you say yes. You know what? It's only half a percent more than the going rate that I saw on Lending Tree or my bank or my mm-hmm. credit union. Or, or I, can, I can always go refinance it right. later. I can refinance <laughs> no one, it later. Yeah. Meanwhile, for that half a percent, the bank probably cut a check back to the dealership mm-hmm. for probably seven hundred bucks. Yeah. So they make seven hundred bucks on the loan. Mm-hmm. They're probably making another thousand on the insurance of the extended yeah. warranty or whatever else. Yeah. So normally where they would just mark the car up 2000 and say that's the price, these guys are saying, you can have the car at cost. That's okay. I know you went online. I know you did your research. But in the background, even without you knowing, they made money anyway. They yeah. still made their $1,700, $2,000 profit on you. Yep. And you were happy to do it. Yeah. And they, they want, you know, you want that car. They you and I, I mean I'm I'm guilty because I go in and most of the time when I buy a car it's because the current car that I have is dead on the side of the road or at some mechanic shop. I drive cars into the ground, so well. Right out of college, when I got my first real job. No, I would go and I, I'm tired of this car now. I want another that, one. I'm like and, that. I'm still like that today. <laughs> I'm, I'm in my mid forties or my early forties. I still do that. Like, you know what? I drove this car for eight months. Yeah, it's time to go. Yeah, I when, got it. Yeah. When, when I was bored. twenty-five, I was stupid. I was like, "This is oh, we'll pay your old loan off." Oh, they're paying my old loan. No, they're just refinancing that into your current loan, and now you know, seven times later, now you're paying for seven different cars on this thing. I'll say I, I, when I when I graduated college, and this is back in the early two thousands. I still think that I graduated in the perfect time to go get a new car. Mm-hmm. Because that's when leasing was kind of in its heyday. Mm-hmm. And you could get, and I remember the first car I leased, it was a 2001 Nissan Pathfinder SE. Had, it was the only SUV out there you get with a stick shift beside, yep. beside a 4Runner. Yeah. But if anyone who drove a 4Runner back then knew it was, it went to 0 to 60 in about a year and a half. Yeah, the speedometer was a calendar. Yeah. So... Back then, Nissan had that that 3.5 liter VQ engine, mm-hmm. and made it to that that five speed transmission. This thing for an SUV would get up and go. Yeah, it wasn't a race car. Yeah, but it gave you it it, it gave you a nice car mm-hmm. that with a little bit of oomph to it. Yeah. Um, by the way, they used the same setup in the Maxima with the with the SE. Mm-hmm. You could get that five speed. Yeah, that was a nice little setup. But anyway, you could go in. Two hundred dollars down, I think I got that car for two fifty a month. Oh wow, <laughs> two fifty a month! I couldn't believe it. I was like, two fifty a month. This yeah. is fantastic. <laughs> and of course, being the moron that I was, when the lease was up, I turned it in. Mm-hmm. Got nothing for it. Yeah, turned around, and I leased a, I think it was like a two thousand five Altima with the three point the three point five liter engine again. Mm-hmm. I love that engine. Yeah. But I, I was like, I want something new. I want something fun. So I got the 3.5 liter engine and an Altima, and that thing zipped around. And then, I, of course, I turned that into a Murano. I, <laughs> the, the people at the Nissan dealership are like, this is easy money. Oh, they saw this guy easy coming. Money. They, they saw you coming. They were like, hmm, I'm going to eat tonight. That's right. And so I, I think that yeah. nowadays, though, to lease cars, even to lease a nice car, you're not going to get in at two hundred, three hundred dollars a month unless you put a hefty amount down, or they're running some special kind of deal yeah. on a car nobody wants. Yeah, yeah, you know? it's going to be dealer stock on like either ridiculous base model or a stupid package, or you know it'll be it'll be uh, you know that awful pinkish brownish color and you know, if it's a suv it'll be two-wheel drive like the, like why did you even make this car which is neat because they send those cars to dealers that they don't like like they will send them to 
if the dealer falls out of favor with the the manufacturer, they will get this garbage and like they're stuck with it. And a lot of these cars are done. Um, they have to make payments on their inventory, and they're, they're stuck with this this turd that they just cannot get rid of. So like they almost pay you to take it from them. Like just get this thing out of here. So um, yeah, they uh, you'll you'll have some awful piece of garbage like that. But, so. but right now though you. So uh, kind of getting back to that cargo ship. Yep. Right now, even though that one was heading for to Europe, but right now with the with the chip shortages and the foam shortages and some of these new car manufacturers shut down for a couple of weeks because they don't have supplies to make cars. Yeah. Even the worst cars you can imagine, they're going to go for crazy prices right yeah. now. And dealerships especially and this is especially with the cars that people want tru- trucks in particular cause yeah as as much as a lot of people don't get it trucks are the number one seller in this country yeah the ford f-150 is the best selling model in this entire country yep and if you want a ford f-150 you're gonna pay msrp right now oh yeah because shortages are happening all over the place yep and now you you've got cars that were were supposed to go to Europe that can't get through right now. Mm -hmm. And who knows when they're going to be able to get some supply there. So if you're in Europe, you're probably in worse shape. If you're going to buy a car probably in Europe, I would say try and buy one now before they even realize that they're not going to have cars for a little while. Yeah. Especially if they can't get anything there for six weeks. So if you're in Europe and prices are reasonable, buy it now. Yeah. If you're in the U S though, you, you might have a hard time going through the summer. You might want to hold on to what you got or kind of stretch it out a little bit. Yeah, I'm wondering what... Uh, so, like, Ford, I know, is... Uh, the F-150 is up for this, I think, 22 is a fresh, like, a clean sheet redesign on the... Or a significant um, redesign on that that truck for... So, the 21, this is the last year for it. And a lot of times, you wait... Like, I'd always wait to get that... If I was to buy a new car, which I rarely do, but if I were to buy one, I'd buy it at the end of a model year because or end of a cycle. Right. Because you usually get it for a song. Right. You know, there'll be huge like when Dodge recently especially when uh when they dropped the Dodge moniker from the Ram and it became now Ram's like its own brand. Um and they, they re, I think that was uh was that eighteen? I believe it was eighteen. Eighteen or nineteen when they did that. There were you know the the seventeen Rams that you could get for. I mean, they were taking they were taking stupid amounts of money off of them, and I just wonder if if that's going to happen or if there's just going to be a shortage of inventory. Where nope, we're going to keep that price super high on the even the twenty ones. Nope, you, you're going to pay pay out the nose for the twenty one as well. I think I think new trucks are going to have a rough time. Mm-hmm. I think used cars you you still might have some wiggle room depending on when the dealer bought it wholesale. Yeah. Um, but I guess the moral of the story of this uh, of this one here is that if you need a car, just keep your eye on things. See if you can get some negotiation in there. Yeah. But for now, this is all we have for this episode. And thank you for listening. Hopefully you come back for episode two. And, and thereafter, uh, our website is uh, dumbideapodcast.com. Uh, we'll have more info up there as we kind of grow this channel a little bit. And hopefully we'll, we'll see you soon. Thanks.